Hey, Talent Warriors, welcome to another episode of the Talent War podcast, where we discuss all things talent and human capital related. Today, we have Miss Lori O'Brien, a great leader that I had the privilege to work with, who came up through the HR space over 25 years in all kinds of roles, specializing in total rewards, compensation, global compensation, and who spent the last three years as the CHRO of an industry-leading human-centric cybersecurity company. So stand by as we talk about compensation, the great resignation, and how you lead and can lead better in the COVID post-pandemic environment. All right, Warriors, welcome back. We have Lori O'Brien, who has taken her brief sabbatical. And when I met her, she used to sit in a cube across from me, and she's a little shorter than me, and I would see this blonde hair pop up over my cube when I said something that made her wonder why I was in the HR space, which was about two or three times a week. But she was our head of total rewards, compensation, and benefits, And we had the opportunity, as we've talked about many times, when you lose somebody, we lost our CHRO, and most people would turn to the outside. We had the great fortune of having Lori and having somebody that at that point in time, there just couldn't have been a better person to go lead our HR organization with the trust, the respect, the knowledge, the personality. And for those of you that know me, and you guys remember Karen Clark, two of the most cynical HR leaders on the planet, This is our polar opposite, somebody who is optimistic and somebody who has a big heart and led with the head and the heart, which was great. So she has risked it all to come back and talk with me. So Lori, welcome. So tell us about you other than the crazy stuff I just told you. I told you we would go that way. So. Well, thanks, George. (laughs) And and I'm glad you brought up that visual of the cubicles because one of the fondest memories I had was, and I still joke about it now, of when we ultimately get back into the office, one of my favorite times was being in that interim CHRO role, but I was in a cubicle. How many CHROs <laughs> get to be in a cubicle and sitting amongst their team? It was fun. I really enjoyed that. I liked being among the people that I was working with day in, day out. It was great. But I've been in HR for my entire career. When I was in college, I had no clue in the first couple of years what I wanted to do and then took an HR course. And then I was just hooked and it was all over from there. So I've seen a lot, and I know you have too in the last 25 Mm -hmm. plus years, but I got to tell you, even after going through Y2K and then the 2008 financial crisis, I don't know that anything really prepared me for the Mm -hmm. last couple of years. And what was unique for me personally was going into a role where I was the most senior people leader in a time where there was no playbook. It was totally unprecedented. And so Mm -hmm. it stretched me in ways that I could have never imagined. But as I reflect on kind of where I am today versus where I was a couple of years ago going into the pandemic and then ultimately kind of where we are now in the great resignation, I keep going back to a lot of the things that that you've talked about, which is there are just certain attributes that are so critical. I mean, we can't predict everything that's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. We can have all the right skills and we can be technically great, but there are just certain character level attributes that are so critically important that just help us navigate through that difficult time. And I think that was one of the things that kind of helped me get through it is just leaning on some core principles that I lived by and maybe didn't even necessarily know that I had for the last 25 years. Yeah, it was so funny because you and I had lots of arguments before you went into, well, arguments, uh, (laughs) healthy discussions. We had our fair share of arguments. And I want to tell the listeners this because I thought this was unique and I have to call myself out for being the skeptical one. I really was because I've been all over the world in the military. I've seen disease. I've seen all kinds of things. So when COVID started kicking up, There was a huge part of me that was like, really, seriously? And I know that social media blows everything up. The Mm -hmm. media blows everything up. If you want to be smarter in the world, turn off the news, turn off social media. You'll just get smarter standing still. But you, 
and this was just weird because one of the attributes that we talk about is effective intelligence. To your point, effective intelligence is coming up with a solution where no previous book solution existed. And as much as I was skeptical, I finally came around because you got ahead in a way that I haven't seen any other company get ahead when you started classifying employees before the lockdown. That was seriously genius. And you went into it. It didn't look like genius at the time. It, it was ruffling feathers. But when I look back on it, I'm thinking, man, I was skeptical and I just learned a ton. But you were ahead of that and you started classifying your workers. That was one of the things, but it just came so natural to you. And it, I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> <laughs> How did that come about? And I mean, is it paying dividends now? Did it help kind of mitigate the turbulence that you went through? I think it was helpful. Interestingly enough, we had started even before the pandemic coming together as a, we had an enterprise preparedness council and we started to try and put together all of these what if scenarios. We really needed it. Like every other company, we had to put a good sort of governance structure around it, if you will. So I don't know if it's fortuitous. I don't know if it was just luck, if you will. But when I kind of take the broader view of all things HR, it all starts with what do we do as an organization and then what are the roles that we play in the organization? And that kind of serves as your foundation. And if you don't have that, then when you try to create organization through chaos, it's too difficult. It's too turbulent. So that classification system, if you will, was something that I've done in previous organizations before even coming to Force Point. And so it served me well because it just creates the truth, if you will, and the foundation beyond which you can build everything else off of. Yeah. And, you know, I was just thinking, because <laughs> I remember the conversations we had when you took the interim job and who could have predicted that you'd be smack dab in the middle of COVID lockdown, vaccinations, not vaccinated, who is, who isn't, what should we do? Oh, and then by the way, you had a PE firm decide to buy you in the middle of all of that, as if the degree of difficulty on this dive was not <laughs> sufficiently high. And then the great resignation kicks in. Yeah. And maybe it's the camera. I don't see any more gray hair. I would have been snow white by the time. You're still looking great. Well, yeah. As long as you have a good hairdresser, you can cover up a lot. <laughs> but I don't know. I would say that perhaps being new in the role was helpful rather than a hindrance because it allowed me to kind of look at things from an open slate perspective and oh, then yeah. go back to those things that I felt were critically important. And it was funny. I was thinking about this the other day that when we first went into lockdown, if you will, and everybody went remote around the middle of March 2020, I remember having conversations with senior leaders about, we'll just do this through May or June 2020. <laughs> you know, we weren't even thinking at that That's point. That's that time optimism that, I just talked about. Two, yeah, that it was going to be two <laughs> years down the road. But one of the things that I had started, it was right before the pandemic, and you'll remember this. And again, perhaps it was fortuitous, but I remember one of the most important things I felt in order to be able to lead effectively throughout the organization was to have a structure and a system of leadership that we could leverage through any kind of transformation or change or turbulence or whatever you want to call it. And so we set up that global leadership forum that was about 50, 60 top leaders. And it was really intentional in a way to be the conduit for how we were going to establish culture for how we were going to communicate to the organization, for how we were going to set strategy. And I was so glad that we put that in place literally just a couple of months before the pandemic came into play, because we started leveraging that group more and more. It was so easy to bring 50 or 60 people together on a Zoom call and really talk through what's going on and what do we need to share with people, as opposed to constantly having to get the CEO and a couple of other people up mm -hmm. there on a stage, if you will, every week or every other week. And so having that system or that structure in place, I think was really critically important. 
and I've learned at least since then that it's a great structure to have in place just on an ongoing basis because it's a really easy way to constantly try and keep connected to the organization through beyond just your top 10 in the C-suite, if you will. As I've said many times, with the post-pandemic, the pandemic, and the great resignation, it is the era of the CHRO. Your HR and your talent acquisition teams are the front line as you fight the war for talent. Like any essential component, they need to be fortified, trained, and supported. Talent War Group's Talent Acquisition and HR Consulting Development Service helps your organization learn to attract and retain top talent and help you gain an advantage against your competitors. Our current job market, like I said, is the great resignation. And now the great attrition is what you're seeing and many other names due to the record number of workers quitting their jobs. You know, 52% of the employees are currently looking for a new job. So let us help you get it right, know what the best talent looks like, attract the best talent, and help your company thrive. The Talent War Group brings a unique set of skills to help you take your business to the next level. You can get started by finding us at talentwargroup.com and let us help you develop your next generation of leaders. I would imagine it probably made the clarity of communications a whole lot easier because you know, there's a couple of clients that I'm coaching right now that it's like an edict or a lightning bolt comes out of the CEO, the visionary, the COO, and it hasn't gone through. And some people call the filters bureaucracy, but in times of COVID and rapidly changing scenarios, collaboration on how you communicate will keep that cohesive distant culture, that consistent messaging. Did you have to drag people kicking and screaming into communication or were they less skeptical than George? Maybe that's the question. And they <laughs> go, okay, Lori, we're with you. Let's get after it. As with every leadership group in every company, you have those that are great adopters and great communicators. And you have those that rise up through the ranks and maybe communication wasn't their strong suit. Mm -hmm. It may never be. So it was a little bit of a mix. And one of the things that we did, I think it was probably about a month or two into the pandemic, we did this communication survey to just test to see how well we were communicating as an organization. And, and I was able to pinpoint certain leaders who had some challenges. And so I started digging in with each one of them individually and kind of coaching them on here's some strategies. We also rolled out, we partnered with this external firm to come up with this toolkit around different ways we communicate and how we leverage all these different tools between one-on-one, skip levels, town halls, and how we really had to use all of those things in our portfolio to make sure that we were communicating on an ongoing basis. And we really couldn't communicate enough during that time. I really felt very strongly about that. And in communicating from not just a, you know, what's going on, what's happening, but being more personal with people. I remember having a conversation with the CEO at the time where our big overall cybersecurity strategy was we were a human-centric cybersecurity. And so I remember having the conversation with him as the pandemic was getting kind of heating up that we need to take that human-centric strategy and apply that to our people. We've got to put the human in how we lead and manage people on a day-to-day basis, especially now. It's most critically important that they see us not just as leaders, but as humans. Yeah. And that's something we haven't talked about on the podcast, but you guys did do a phenomenal job, which was using the whole toolkit. Because there's clearly an over-reliance and an over-reliance now with COVID, some in the office, some not in the office, that email. Oh, we sent an email. Everybody understood it. Everybody knows what to do. I've passed the ball off. It drives me nuts. Well, because I know that we're going to go for 45, but the great resignation 
came on, did it catch you by surprise or did you start seeing early signs of it? Now, you were in a little bit of a pickle. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of companies, a lot of people that listen are, when a private equity firm buys you, there's always going to be a trimming of the sales. Yep. There's always going to be a look at the inefficiencies, maybe where we're over leveraged in headcount, where we're under leveraged, and there's going to be personnel changes. So that's always going to be in the mix. But did you see kind of this great resignation and people saying, you know what, I'm kind of done with work or it's come in all kinds of forms. Did you start to see it early or was it just kind of one of those things that was like one day you're looking at it and going, okay, Houston, we have a problem. It's hard for me to separate what happened to us mm. because the senior leadership team had completely anticipated some level of attrition, some level of, of increased attrition after our acquisition. You've got this period of time where new ownership's coming in. There was a massive senior leadership change. And so there's a natural change in strategy. So you're in this sort of cloud of uncertainty for a period of time. And that is just a recipe for attrition. Mm -hmm. People don't know what's happening. They don't know if they're secure. And it, you can communicate all kinds of things, but when you're in the midst of it, and especially as you talked about, we certainly went through a restructuring and that sort of adds to the whole uncertainty of where are we going? Why am I here? Am I going to still be here? Mm -hmm. So we knew it. And interestingly enough, when we finished our first major round of restructuring, that was when the great resignation really started heating up, if you will, around Ugh. the rest of the globe. <laughs> And I think what was surprising to me was how it was happening to us, but seeing it happening elsewhere. In yeah. hindsight, I think the signs were all there and the signals were all there. And I think we could all say that there was probably a period during 2020 when people were just kind of sitting and staying put and not going anywhere because mm -hmm. they weren't really sure what was happening. And so there was probably a little bit of, I would call it deferred movement where people started catching up to that in early April of this year, and that kind of continued on through the summer. Um, but I think that the, the, the bigger thing that happened not just within Forcepoint, but sort of across the board, is I think that this has been a real period of soul searching. Things happen to people. We saw death on a scale that we hadn't seen before in our lifetime, mm -hmm. and that changes people. And it changes mm -hmm. people fundamentally. When I think about the big events, I talked about earlier Y2K and the dot-com bust and boom and a 2008 financial crisis, we swung back. Things went back to normal after that. But this feels different. I feel mm -hmm. like there's going to be this fundamental shift and time will tell if that's truly the case. But I think that the signs and the signals and people had been telling us for a period of time, we're going too hard, we're going too fast, we need to slow down just a little bit because there's too much of my life that I'm giving up. And mm -hmm. as I'm now working remote, the lines are blurred. And I don't know when work ends and when personal life begins, and I'm not managing it very well. And so there just kind of came this collective. The choice I have in front of me is I got to just leave to get out of this. Yeah. Versus kind of staying and seeing where it goes from there. So I wasn't going to correct you, but I want to get your opinion on something because, A, I'm giving a presentation in two days to about 70 people. And I did a test drive in this mastermind series. And the phrase I thought I heard you say is that people think we're going to get back to normal. Yeah. And the more that I thought about that in my presentation, the more I thought, that's not right. Yeah. And it can't physically happen because when we move people to remote, they now had to change healthcare, fitness, relationship, grocery shopping. I mean, yep. how much toilet paper do I keep on hand? I mean, <laughs> down to the little tiny things. We now cook at home, the binge watching. But then as it started to unwind, but what people did is recraft their whole life to your point of now where does work end? Where does personal life begin? They're all blurred. And my argument was, and I wanted to ask you if you think this is true. I'm like, because we've been doing that so long, that's everybody's new normal. Yeah, I would agree. And to say to come back to work is now unwinding yet again. We're not going back to normal. We're actually in the new normal. I agree. I think that the new normal is still to be defined a little bit. We went 
so far to the other extreme from where we were so quickly. And yes, we've gotten used to that. But I do think that there was something that perhaps we haven't acknowledged to the extent that we need to, which is we're made to be interactive. And, mm-hmm. and yes, we can. You and I can sit here and have a conversation on Zoom online, but it doesn't replace being face to face. It doesn't replace me sitting in that cube and you leaning over the cube and us having a conversation. You just can't replace that. And so I do think that there's going to be some element of needing to be with each other. What that means and to what extent we come back in and how often that is, I think that is the big question. And I think that's going to certainly vary by industry for sure. But in industries where you can be much more flexible, you and I know have a colleague, Karen Clark, who mm-hmm. is just one of the greatest HR leaders of all time from my perspective. My evil and twin. She, <laughs> and she <laughs> made a comment not long ago that I loved and I keep stealing, which is we should really just pivot hard and give people a choice. That's pretty dramatic. But, you know, in industries where you can, you should. Because that's really what gives you the competitive advantage. Comp's going to take you only so far from that perspective. But the more we can introduce flexibility and we Mm -hmm. give people that choice and allow them to be as maximally flexible, if that's even a word, that is what I think will make the biggest difference. And I wanted to ask you, because I do want to get to the comp, because... There's no better person when I brag about you (laughs) and I talk about, hey, we've got this project. We've got to ask Lori. I tell people, I don't know if you can really do it, but to me, in my mind, you can. And by the way, there was one time when you looked over our cube and it was a Friday and we had our own little happy hour there at the cube, which was one of those moments. (laughs) Tequila. Yeah. And for those, she did come all the way around and participate. So she, you know, (laughs) just wanted to say that she leads by example. We'll say that. But one topic that I started to coach people on, because they have to be flexible, I have seen with the people that I'm talking to, the nature of leading remote and now via Zoom and email has, if you had cracks or shortcomings in your leaders at every level, those cracks became chasms. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering if you had seen that because... It's one thing to teach leadership, and it's one thing to, hey, you got to start over communicating, but you run into Zoom fatigue. But I have seen that more and more and more. And so one of the things that I'm about to present is part of the great resignation is that we're teaching people how to hire better, how to hire faster, how to look at the attributes, quit over rotating on experience. If ever there were a time for you to take a flyer, pivot hard and go on the attributes versus experience, this is the time because the labor market, it's all a candidate's market. Yep. But I was sharing with these people that thought, hey, go ahead and double down, push hard on getting better at your talent acquisition piece. But guess what? The one thing you can do right now is start doubling down and investing in your leaders and making them better leaders. Because I, even with the great resignation, And people reevaluating their lives. I think they were also reevaluating their bosses and how good they really were. I totally agree. And it's funny you bring that up because I was reflecting on there. There is in your book towards the very end, you have this section that's called build a world-class leadership foundation. And there's this quote in it that I absolutely love. It's talent has a choice where it chooses to work and it won't Mm -hmm. put up with bad leadership. And I don't think we've been suffering necessarily from collective bad leadership, but I think it can do a lot better. And there's one word that keeps coming to mind that I think that those who navigated well and who are navigating well now are doing this extraordinarily well. And so I have this good friend who started a ministry this year, and she was telling me that one of the things she does every January, she comes up with a word. And that word defines her for the year. And she kind of organizes her whole life around that one word. And so that must be one powerful (laughs) word to do. It really is. And so the word that just keeps coming to my mind and has kept coming to my mind now and into 2022 for leaders is listen. You can have Zoom calls all day long, but what everybody's going through is so uniquely different. 
So you have to take the time to listen. And there was a strategy that I heard a consultant say a couple of months ago, which was, don't just get on a Zoom call and say, how you doing? And the person says, oh, I'm doing okay. No, lean in. No, how are you really doing? Get specific, draw them out, and really listen to what they're telling you. Because what they need is going to be different from in, in every single person on your team and the needs that they have are going to be drastically different. One size doesn't fit all. Compensation is not going to fix all of that. It's really going to take your great listening skills and then doing something about it. Yeah. Carly just did a great video snippet and the title of it was It's Time to Lean In. And she said that each employee has a different ROI for your organization and a completely different set of needs. Yep. I was like... And that is probably the biggest challenge from a compensation perspective. And one of the biggest yeah, challenges we're going, we're going to be face, <laughs> Yeah, as we think about the future and where we're headed from a compensation perspective, we're becoming more and more diverse. We're generationally more and more diverse. And you look at what those who are reaching retirement need versus what those who are entering the workforce need. And that's always been, you know, there have been differences there, but it's becoming much more individualistic, which is very difficult to accommodate in three compensation programs. So oh, yeah. one of our biggest challenges and one of the things that I'm going to be thinking about when the next five, 10 years is how do we set up processes and systems to allow us to be much more individualistic? Maybe we take X percent mm -hmm. of the total package and that becomes the core and the foundation. But then there is this X percent, maybe 20 to 30 percent, which becomes much more choice driven. Well, how do we make that happen? And how do we deal with all of the constraints like tax code and systems and all of those things? I think oh, yeah. that is where we're headed. This episode is sponsored by Talent War Group, a management consulting and executive search firm. We help you attract, retain, and develop your top talent because we know that the most valuable asset within your organization is your talent. With services like leadership development, talent acquisition and HR consulting, executive search, executive coaching, and keynote speeches, we work with you to create talent solutions to your most pressing business problems. You can get started by finding us at talentwargroup.com and let us help you develop your next generation of leaders. Also, if you like what we're doing here at the podcast, please leave a review as it helps us support and continue this podcast. It helps us support people who are really dedicated to improving their business skills and excelling above all else. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about is most of the people that I'm talking to, I'm coaching about talent, about hiring, about hiring, planning, how to hire them, how to look for the attributes. But there's always that piece of compensation. And one of the challenges is because it's a candidate's market, you're having to pay a little bit more and sometimes a lot more, either to rest people away from where they are or to bring them to your environment, be that remote, flex, or in the office. And I was talking to somebody and they're like, look, I will pay whatever I need to pay. And I'm like, <laughs> hold on, because anyway, where I was going with this is there's two things that stick out in my mind. And number one is going to be salary compression. The people that yeah. stick and stay and have stayed with your firm and not being able to move those compensation up by five, six, seven percent, you're sometimes having 15, 20 percent jumps to hire out into the market. I mean, now I think we're accelerating the wage compression. And then my second thought is when we do come back around, the people that are sitting on high comp are now more at risk, meaning we're creating solutions now that are absolutely creating problems in the future. And did you see kind of, of the people that you wanted to attract, did you see a quick rise in wages? Did you and hold firm? How did you tackle it? It was a little bit of a mix. And so I would say in the aggregate, we did not have a major compensation challenge on our hands. We had it in 
pieces and parts. And so mm-hmm. in areas like, you know, and you know this in our government business where we had these very specialized engineers that had to have certain levels of clearance where they were yep. so high in demand. We saw some really crazy stuff out there from a compensation perspective. And so in mm-hmm. some cases we had to match, in some cases we had to get more aggressive with doing some proactive market adjustments. And so in parts of the business, we ended up having to make some strategic investments where either we weren't quite there where we needed to be from a market perspective or the market was just starting to get way out of hand. But overall, there are other strategies you can deploy. If someone's leaving you, you can take a look at how you're going to backfill that role. So if you backfill that role and you're going to have to upgrade the comp by 20%, do you think differently about the role? Because Mm -hmm. over time, that kind of compensation growth that is across the board is going to be unsustainable. I think being in tech, we were somewhat fortunate because we had, by and large, we're in an industry where people are paid fairly well compared to other industries. Think about retail and hospitality where they were literally faced with having to go from 12 to 15 bucks an hour overnight. And that's a really tough thing for an organization to take on immediately. And so we didn't have that kind of issue. But I think that some of the other things that we experienced were, well, let's think about compensation differently. Let's look at how we're backfilling this role. Let's also make sure that compensation's not the real root reason why people are leaving. If you've got people mass leaving you for 20% increases and it's across the board, you've got a compensation problem. But if you've got it happening here and there, you don't have a major compensation problem. But if you still have high attrition, there's something else going on. So you got to dig in and see maybe compensation is not the real reason they left. Maybe that's just sort of the icing on the cake as they left. You got to have leaders in quite a panic that are wanting to throw money at people, counter offers and otherwise And you've heard me argue this when we work together, not with you, but with business leaders. This is why HR has to be strategic Yep, is because you're going to get those managers that are losing people or want this shiny object that's out there. And the first thing they do is money to pull somebody in. And the first thing somebody leaving, they want to throw money at them. It's like the only arrow in their quiver. Yes, it's the easiest lever you can pull. It doesn't require much leadership effort from you. As long as you've got the budget or you can make room in the budget or you can make some appropriate trade-offs, it's a really easy thing to do, but it's short term. If you don't address the root cause truly of why that person's leaving and understand the real reasons that made them want to look in the first place, then you're going to be back in that same boat six months, a year down the road. Well, you and I know that. One of the things that we tried to help leaders understand, and I'll give you two really good examples. We actually had in our HR organization over the last four months, two people on the same team resigned. And so they were part of that great resignation. And, And so we could have thrown money at them. We could have given them better titles. We could have sort of glossed it up, if you will. But we took the time to understand what was really driving them to leave. Neither one of them had a job they were going to. So that was interesting. And so we leaned in with them and understood they were burned out. They were fatigued. They had been part of the HR organization that had Mm -hmm. been caring for the rest of the organization over the last 18 months. And they were tired. And they just couldn't see any relief down the road. And so we took a step back. And we said, okay, well, what if a couple of months off, what if you had time to just recharge, relax, and then come back? Would all of the things that you like about working here, the developmental opportunities and the great team you work with, those would still be in place when you get back. If you got the rest that you needed, would this still be the place that you'd want to be? And so both of them, we agreed to give them that time off. We agreed as leaders that we were going to have to step up and do some of the work while they were out, but they came back. And not only were they more engaged when they came back, but the people around them started seeing, wow, this is an organization that's going to listen to me. That's going to take care of my needs. So it's worth being here. So somebody might offer me an extra 10, 20%, but you know what? Mm -hmm. This 
and in the way my leadership treats me is worth more than that. Yeah. And for those people listening, there's got to be such a small percentage of people who have thought that way or even considered giving people a break and to suck up their work. That requires everybody else now to be a little bit more overloaded. Yep. And I know the circumstances there, when you have the private equity and they're leaning you out, leaning you leaning HR out in COVID and the great resignation and the cuts, my feeling on that, I thought that they were absolutely brain dead of all of the people that needed to be invested in. It was because what it was people that's going to carry it through. But I've argued yep. that till I was blue in the face. But it was great that you were able to do that. That's such a wonderful, wonderful example. And I hope people listening will take that to heart. Maybe somebody just does need a break. Yeah. Money is the easy answer, but it, it isn't is. the answer. Mike and I, when we give speeches, there's this Project Oxygen. I don't know if you ever heard of it, that Google mm -mm. did. I think it went eight to 10 years. I don't know, 20, 30,000 people. And they said to rank the things that were most important in leaders and technical skills came in eighth wow listening skills were up near the top a good boss with leadership that listened that communicated that created a great culture and culture is behaviors so it's so funny and money wasn't in the top 10 yeah that my boss gives me money so it just reaffirms. But you know, what's interesting is I hadn't heard anybody say that. And I think it's such a great example to give those people time. Yeah, I would agree. But, and I do think that we are in for a little bit of a challenge that we haven't had to experience, at least since I've been working. And that's here in the U.S., the inflation that we're starting to see. I think that's going to put pressure on compensation in ways that we haven't really had to address in a very long time. Yeah, it's the one thing we don't get into are the politics because then all of my podcasts would be about seven <laughs> hours long. Um, yeah, but it's real from a – It um, is real. I think we're going to have to face, and it will put pressure on us. But I also think that it's going to make all of those other things that we bring to the table from an engagement and employment perspective even more important because we're not going to be able to – very quickly raise everybody's salaries 5, 10, 15 percent in two years. And so all of those other things are going to become increasingly more important. Yeah, I keep telling people the most important thing you can do is bring good leadership to the table. That is the biggest safety net that you can have. And if somebody leaves for more money and you're providing great leadership, you can always move the money if you need to. So you've taken a hiatus. You've taken your mm -hmm. rest break. Yeah. And how many years in the seat were you? Just under three. Wow. Crazy. Three years. And I'm <laughs> now feeling my age because that means when did you stepped into the role? It would have been January only eight, or, eight or nine months after I got there. Okay. Yeah. When you look back, if you had to pick kind of and they could be two things that you did right, but two or three things that you would pass on. Because one of the things that I appreciated, and I am extremely biased, but I have the right to be, because the people that were on my team in talent acquisition, the people that were on your team that were in ops, that were in HRBP, you and I have always agreed in my evil twin, Karen, and then Auntie M, for those of you that don't know, Emily McLaughlin. I think we had assembled one of the finest teams on so many different levels. And we had our warts and we had our problems, but unbelievable team. But when you look back over your three years, if you were to say three things that you got right or that you wish you had done differently, that you were going to coach somebody to be a more, not a better CHRO, but just a strategic human capital leader to keep in mind, to better take care of people, better take care of companies. You can go anywhere you want. You've had time to think. What stands out to you or what would you pass on to people? There are two things that I've found that are important from a consistency perspective. 
and this is something that I felt very strongly about, if I focus on these two things and then all of the things that feed into them, that I think we can navigate through this and I think we can create a great culture as well. One is to be purposeful, and I'll talk about what I mean by that. And the second is to be personal. Purposeful, especially as you look at some of the younger generations, um, they're increasingly, as they assess where they want to work, working for an organization that has purpose and they know where they fit and they know how they're contributing has become an increasingly important part of what defines them in their working lives. And I could say that for really every generation. And so as a leader, what I help and what I have tried to do over the last couple of years specifically is really keep front and center. We have to know what it is we're about as an organization. Mm -hmm. So we can't just slap a vision and a mission statement up there and just let it go. We have to really keep it front and center. We have to have very specific objectives and strategic imperatives, if you will, that tie to that, that as leaders, we have to understand intimately and we have to connect the dots every single day. It's not just about, oh, let's talk about it, bring it up every quarter or once a mm -hmm. year and say, here's what we did. But in conversations that you're having, in meetings that you're having, as you're talking about the deliverables, always be connecting those dots, make people understand and keep that front and center of this is why I'm here, because we all get to that point in time in our day or our week or our month or whatever time frame when we are sitting there going, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Yeah. And so <laughs> it's important that we are always keeping that front and center in people's minds. And so connecting those dots every single day. And the second part of that is being personal and it's understanding who the people are that are around us and that work for us and that we work for. And especially for those people that we lead, understand what's going on. You don't have to be their best mm -hmm. friend, but understanding what's happening in their personal lives, letting them talk about what's happening. Listen to the times where you might have to lean in a little bit and take something off their plate, or you might have to lean in a little bit and then help coach them along, but understand them on a more personal level and not just look at them as the person who is producing some kind of work product or a deliverable for you, but they're yeah. a whole person and they have a whole life outside of their interaction with you. Allow them to bring who they are to work every single day. And so that means getting much more personal than I think we ever have been in the work environment. So purposeful and personal and just be present. I love them. And you see me, I'm making notes because some time hacks and some great pieces of advice you passed on. So I'll ask the final question. And for our listeners, I give these in advance. But if you had to go back and tell 22-year-old Lori O'Brien, which wasn't that long ago, we'll say that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Things that would make your career your performance, your overall life better. What is your wisdom to pass on to leaders at every level about having a great, great career? Because I got to say, and before you answer the question, you are one of the people both personally and professionally that it was a gift for me to work with you. Now, well, when I first looked across the cube and saw you over there, I'm like, okay, she's a little stiff. She's in total <laughs> rewards and comp and benefits. I'm like, oh, she is totally not going to get my sense of humor. And which was true because the first few weeks, you're like, holy shit, who is this guy on the other side of the cube? <laughs> and did anybody vet him before he came in? <laughs> and I get that. And it took a while, but... On my end, after getting to work with you, I'm immensely better on so many levels that I can't even count them of having the great privilege to work with you and then come to know you personally. So from a leader that I admire and respect, I'm just kind of anxious to hear what you're going to pass on to those people who want to be the next Lori O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. And before I answer the question, I think it's the last few years have been just such a blessing for me. As you indicated the team that we had, that was unprecedented for me. And yeah. I learned so much from each and every one of you. 
and I love the fact that sitting in 25 years into a career that I'm still learning something that I can still mm -hmm. learn from the people that report to me and my peers as well. But a couple of things, if I could go back to my younger self, and they're two very different things. One is just say thank you more often. Be much more intentional and I'll use the word liberal with oh, acknowledging, <laughs> encouraging and praising others. I think early on and through, especially the first few years I was managing people, I didn't do that enough. But you see what that does to people and you see how that brings out discretionary effort in people that just hearing thank you, and just hearing those words of appreciation, doing that more often and not being disingenuous with it. But I was probably a little too stingy in my early days. And the second piece is, and I think that this is probably something that may not have ever applied to you, George, but I would say, <laughs> you know, speak up often and don't give up. I think yeah, that, that didn't um, apply. <laughs> the lack of speaking up did not apply to me ever. <laughs> I think that sometimes when we're early in our careers and we may not feel the confidence of speaking mm -hmm. our minds, maybe we feel like we don't have the experience and those that are surrounding us who may be 10, 20, 30 years into their careers, we feel like they might know a little bit more than we do, but there is something so wonderful about a fresh perspective that those of us mm -hmm. who have been working for a long time need to hear. And so even if you feel like you're getting shut down and people are saying, oh yeah, we tried that. We can't do that. Don't give up. Be persistent. When it's something important, keep speaking your mind, keep speaking up. Yay. I love that. I'm going to give you a twist at the end. <laughs> Free uh -oh. shot. What would you ask me now that I'm not working there? If I you totally have... catch you off guard. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to go back to work for a company again, and you weren't mm -hmm. in your own company, how would you describe the next person you would work for? There's so many things, and I think the first thing that I would try to do is make a composite of all of the great people, including you that I've worked with. I would want them to have your heart and your sense of optimism. Alternatively, I'd want them to have Karen's cynicism and dry wit. I would want them to have Emily's posture <laughs> and professionalism because nobody ever you know what i don't even watch her present anymore because it's just i'm not going to hit that level she's just <laughs> she is i think what i would want is what you really said in the purposeful and personal is somebody number one that was always articulating to the company the why we do things and the criticality of my role in the ecosystem i don't need to be the best in the organization I'm not the one developing product. I'm not doing those things, but whatever it is in the company that my team or me personally, I'm recognized for my value, my insight and my experience and listen to. You'll notice what I left out was, I don't need them to do always mm -hmm. yep. because there's sometimes, I've been known to be a little bit further out there than most people are willing to risk, but I loved it. That was one of the great things with you and Matt, our old CEO, at least he listened. Yeah. That's a sign of value. That's a sign of trust. And then somebody that would invest in me. I'm 55. Right. And to your point, it's amazing how much we were learning from one another. And I want somebody to see those things, to see the potential in me and say, hey, George, here's where you can take your game to the next level because I don't like being second best. I don't like falling short. My OCD, my insecurities want me to nail it every time. And that's a good thing that the right leader could tap into and say, hey, George, I really like that presentation. I give it a B plus, A minus. This is what an A plus looks like to me. Yeah. Here's what I think you could do to kind of really put a sharper edge. So somebody that listened, had your heart, had cynicism, had wit, you know what the last thing, and this one's been really, really hard for the leaders that I've worked with. Our team was very, very good, but we mm -hmm. admittedly would lose it from time to time, which is perspective. Mm. 
And you know, in talent acquisition, I got to have that person now. I got to fill that role. Oh my God, this guy is falling. I'm like, okay, this is not climate change. Whether you agree or don't agree, that's not a political statement. It's not world hunger. It's not the nuclear arms race. It's recruiting. It will be there on Monday when we come back. Yep. And there's too many people in the business world, and I appreciate that COVID has accelerated the pressures on executives and leaders to deliver revenue and stuff. I get that. But the best leaders that I've ever seen are the ones who had a great perspective because it allowed them to kind of go do that detach and have the appropriate forward direction or course correction. And it wasn't, I needed this yesterday. You get less emotion. So I don't know that I would ever find all those things that I wanted, but like working with you and working with some of the people over my career, I'm the beneficiary of two things. One, people far smarter and better leaders than me that took the time to invest in me. And I'm the beneficiary of their unending patience with somebody like me. Uh <laughs> Because there's people in me that could have said, oh, that guy's got a lot of potential, but God, he's a pain in the ass. (laughs) And I'm sure all of them did, but they were all, all the leaders that I thought that were great that I've worked with, including you, including Karen, and many of the people we've had, we've spoken with, they've all invested, not just in me, but everybody around them. So leaders that invest, listen, have a big heart, cynicism, perspective, those are the people I love. and. Who knows what the future holds? Who knew when when you and I got together, who the hell knew I'd be saving Matt from himself from time to time or that you would be CHRO? I mean, we walked into our jobs working for a person who was not nice. Yeah. And we thought we were kind of doomed to embrace the suck together. (laughs) Our resiliency, our all of that. I don't know what's next, but another leader that I would work for would have to have all those things. And I think I'm pickier than I've ever been on leadership because of the great people that I've worked with. Yeah. Love that. But well, on the next one, we're going to ask you what's next for you, but I'm going to give you the absolute last word, then sign us off. But as always, your insights just brilliant and how you led and what you did for the people, for me, for my team, for others is just gratitude that we could never pay back. So you get the final word to those people who really want to be better leaders and better talent warriors. So I'll give you the last word and we'll say good night. Hopefully this will be a quick one, but I think that this is appropriate in the age of the great resignation where we're having to say goodbye to people. And I remember when I stepped into the CHRO role, not long after I stepped into it, we had to go through a restructuring. And it was important to me that we do it with great care and great dignity. And so as people are walking out the door, you know, don't treat them as if they just broke up with you. Treat them the same way that you did when they walked in the door. Treat them as that whole person because you never know. They may be Mm -hmm. leaving you because you don't have an opportunity for them right now, but they could come back in a few years having gained this amazing experience and bring just that much more to the organization. So be just as careful and intentional around how you treat people and keeping those relationships alive when they leave as when they come through the door. I love it. It is the one thing that matters more than anything else. It's not your people. It's not your product. It's not your service. It's not your sales. It's none of that. It is always your people. Great advice. Lori, thank you so very, very much. Thank you. And look forward to talking again. All right. Thanks, George. Bye. And thank you for listening to the Talent War podcast, where we discuss all things talent, focusing on a true talent mindset which is a core belief that the only true competitive advantage you can hope to achieve and maintain is your talent. Join us for the next episode of the Talent War podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard, subscribe, please leave a review and connect with Dr. Tom Lokar and myself 
on Talent War Group's LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram accounts and send your comments and inquiries to media at Talent War Group. The Talent War Podcast is brought to you by the Talent War Group, a management consulting and executive search firm. With services like talent acquisition, leadership development, seminars, and executive coaching, we will work with you to create talent solutions to your business problems. To get started, please visit us at www.talentwargroup.com.